Our service was late last Sunday, but it was not late when you showed up.
worship this morning. It is a joy once again to be in front of you. It's nice to be back and uh, thankful for the opportunity to worship together with you. Our order of service is found printed in our worship folder. We begin with our opening hymn. May the Lord bless our worship together this morning. service is found printed in our worship folder. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courtyards with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy endures forever. His faithfulness continues for all generations. Beloved of the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am my nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson is recorded in Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 10. We hear from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God gave me a tongue like the learned, an instructed tongue, so I know how to sustain the weary with the word. He wakes me up morning by morning. He wakes up my ears so that I listen like the learned. The Lord God opened my ear, and I myself was not rebellious. I did not turn back. I submitted my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from disgrace and from spit. The Lord God will help me, so I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have made my face hard like flint. I know that I will not be put to shame. The one who will acquit me is near. Who can accuse me? Let us take our stand. Who can pass judgment on me? Let him approach me. Look, the Lord God will help me. Who then can declare me guilty? Look, all of them will wear out like a garment. A moth will consume them. Who among you worships the Lord and listens to the voice of his servant? Anyone who walks in darkness and who has no bright light, let him trust in the name of the Lord and let him lean on his God. This is God's Word. We join responsibly in our Psalm of the Day, Psalm number 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. Because he turned his ear to me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death. How can I repay the Lord? I will lift up the cup of salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second lesson is recorded in James chapter 2, selected verses. James reminds us that out of thanks for God's amazing grace, for everything we have been given, how can our actions not follow in line with our faith? May James encourage us to live a life of faith of the grace that we have received. My brothers, have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ without showing favoritism. For example, Suppose a man enters your worship assembly wearing gold rings and fine clothing, and a poor man also enters wearing filthy clothing. If you look with favor on the man wearing fine clothing and say, sit here in this good place, but you tell the poor man, stand over there or sit down here at my feet, have you not made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil opinions? Listen, my dear brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? However, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show favoritism, you are committing a sin since you are convicted by this law as transgressors. In fact, whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles in one point, has become guilty of breaking all of it. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith, but has no works? Such faith cannot save them, can it? If a brother or sister needs clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you tells them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, 
but does not give them what their body needs, what good is it? So also, such faith, if it is alone and has no works, is dead. But some people say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. This is God's word. We hear now our verse of the day. Hallelujah. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Hallelujah. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 4. The Gospel lesson also serves as our sermon text this morning. He said, The kingdom of God is like this. A man scatters seed on the ground, and while he sleeps and rises night and day, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. The ground produces fruit on its own, first the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. When the crop is ready, he swings the sickle without delay because the harvest has come. Then he said, To what should we compare the kingdom of God? Or with what parable may we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is one of the smallest of all the seeds planted in the ground. Yet when it is planted, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the sky can nest under its shade. With many similar parables, he continued to speak the word to them as much as they were able to hear. He did not speak to them without a parable, but when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything to them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise At this time, we join in confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into God. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we join in singing our next hymn, hymn number 566, We All Are One in Mission. <coughs>
How many of you have I met before and talked to before? A little more than half. Uh, the others, uh, I look like a total stranger and I might have just been hitchhiking through here and Dan still feeling great, so he said, do you want to preach today? Uh, my, my name is Mark Burkholz, I'm a Wisconsin Synod pastor. I do a lot of traveling, and normally that does not include bringing a robe along. So apologies for that. I've been in meetings in Milwaukee all week, and it didn't seem well to be wearing a robe during those meetings. So I don't have a robe on me today, but I am a pastor. Uh, I helped start a church, and we first met in a room very much like this. That was back in the previous century, in 1982. More importantly, for your purposes, since 2006, I served as one of the Wells Mission Councils. What does that mean? Uh, basically, in a nutshell, I try to help start new churches like this. I try to fix older churches and restart them, and sometimes I even participate in helping the church close in the right way. Uh, more important than any of that, now that you have background, <clears throat> why this particular section? Dan alluded to why is that the basis of our text, our, our sermon today? I, I preach a lot of mission festivals, mission sermons. Typically, it'll be on the latter chapters of Isaiah 50. All that symbolic language that Isaiah used in 600 BC, looking ahead to what it would be like when Messiah would come, or what it would be like when we enter heaven together. Or Matthew 28, going to each, going baptized, or Mark 16, the shorter version of that. Or Luke 10, where he sends out the disciples two by two. Or Romans chapter 10, uh, how is anybody going to know unless you tell them? Or 2 Corinthians 5, uh, that we are all reconciled, and therefore God has made us ambassadors, which all other people are reconciled to God. Well, I probably had 50, if not 60, or 70 sermons on those sections. But he gave me freedom. Pick whatever you want. I picked this. And I think it's important for you where you are at the congregation right now because basically, if you want to fill in those blanks on page nine, what's the first parable is teaching us? Uh, the, the first one is saying there's a timetable. It speaks to us as individuals. Each one of us is being told God has us on a personal timetable when He has brought or is bringing us to faith. And the second one, it's teaching us that God alone knows the size of the kingdom. And we cannot get hung up on numbers and make judgments on are we successful or not. God says, you be faithful, you handle the word, you share the word, and you leave the size up to me. So I guess I just gave you the whole sermon, you can be done. But we're not going to do it that way. We're going to go through this uh, backwards, actually, verses 33 and 34. But what's the third paragraph there on page 9, if you follow along the section? We're going to look at that. Because uh, I think it's always appropriate that while we may talk around the word parable and act like everybody knows that, it's not a word that we use commonly. You know, there are many parables, some 35 or 40 of them in the New Testament, primarily used by Jesus. I don't think that we spend a lot of time talking about what's a parable, what does that parable mean? So we should go back and revisit it. Verses 33 and 34 then. With many similar parables, he, Jesus, continued to speak the word to them as much as they were able to hear. He did not speak to them without a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything to them. So a parable, in simplistic terms is, is simply this. It's a little earthly story with a heavenly or spiritual meaning. Some of you probably went to Lutheran Confirmation. Remember hearing that? The parable is? A little story, spiritual or heavenly meaning. Uh, in many of our churches, we have a little kid's object lesson. Kids come out front, there's an object, there's a story explaining the profound truth in language at the third or fourth grade level. Maybe even at three or four years old level. Sometimes I've had adults tell me, hey, I got a lot more under your kids' message than I did under your sermon. That, in a sense, should not surprise us. Because that, in a sense, is how Jesus taught adults. He's speaking to adults here. And he used a kid's lesson, a, a parable. Now, why do you do that? It's not as though they weren't religious. 
but, but the church, if you will, the Old Testament church that Jesus encountered when he is operating in roughly 30, 31 AD is vastly different from the Jewish church that God had established first through Moses in 1500 BC and then kept alive and probably reached its peak at the time of King David, the psalmist, in roughly 1000 BC. We're a thousand years removed from that. What, what's happened in that thousand years? A lot. And it wasn't good. The church existed as an institution, and they had a beautiful temple, and they had synagogues all over the place, little local places where they could gather on Saturday and encourage one another and teach their children and teach one another. But on the surface, things are looking good, while in reality, things have degenerated since 1000 BC or 1500 BC. It's just ritual, going through the motions. Uh, it's Passover, got to kill a lamb, but the other the lamb will split his throat, some meat for the priest, burn the rest, okay, can we go home now? We're going through the rituals, we're doing the right thing. The concept of a savior, atonement from sin, largely lost. Just do the right thing. And this was encouragement from the leaders to do that. Leaders who've gone down the deviant path and said, you know, the 600 rules and guidelines summarized in the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament, that's not enough. By the time that Jesus comes around, somewhere between 2200 and 2300 rules, including how do you properly eat a fig on the Sabbath? Can you go just like this, or can you throw it up in the air like a kid would do and catch it with your mouth? Well, you can do this, but you can't toss it up in the air. That's a sin, because that's work. That's how crazy it had become. Jesus enters into that culture and says, pause, let me teach you simply, and go back to basic truth. Now, why did he do that? He explains in these verses I read to you, that for those who were among the leaders in the organized church, who called the Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, scribes, remember those terms? For those who said, we don't like you, we've heard you, we've seen the miracles, we don't like you, you are us, serving the apple cart. We've got a system, and it's very good for us. We don't like you, we don't believe. So Jesus would teach simple parables with profound truth that they all knew were right, just to irritate them more, and to harden them in their ugliness. For the masses who had been taught by these misguided leaders, Jesus used parables to say, it's good that you believe in me as the Messiah, that's who I am. But after a thousand years of this, you're terribly confused on issues like creation, and accountability, and trespass of sin, and, and feelings of guilt, and forgiveness, and grace, and what's eternal life look like. And he hones in on those parables, most frequently a topic is just like these parables, what is the kingdom of God? So keep that in mind. Simple story, profound spiritual meaning. It's meant to give a simple truth, but it's not simplistic. It's incredibly profound because it's talking about eternity. Having said that, uh, let's set the context here. You, your listed reading is Mark chapter 4, picking up verse 26, right? If you had the Bible open in front of you and you went back to the beginning of Mark chapter 4, you find probably the best known parable and the longest parable, and a parable in which Jesus took his disciples aside and said, let me explain it to you in case you missed the point. And I think I'm talking to a group of people that probably understands this better than what I'm talking in places where I'm typically at, like suburbs or urban centers. You guys know a few farmers, right? You drive around here, you see a few farmers in this area. Maybe some of you are farmers or have been farmers. I think you get it easier. Jesus lived in a culture in which 90% of the population was agrarian. They might have lived in villages, but they kept farming. Nowadays, uh, we got to spend a lot of time saying, this is what a seed looks like. Uh, this is what happens when you throw it in the ground and it grows. And that's how you get a cute from You can't just go to Kroger and buy that. Somebody had to create that. God did that. I think you understand parables because Jesus used what everybody was familiar with, agrarian truth. In that parable, in the early chapter, early portion of Mark, chapter 4, he says, if 
farmer went out with his seed and scattered it. You've probably seen pictures of how that happened. It wasn't a sack of seeds. A guy would fold up his outer cloth and make some kind of, kind of a portable sack of his own, fill that with seeds, and go down to his field. But he's tempted to turn over at least a little bit. And that's how it goes. He scattered seed in that way. Not terribly efficient, but God said, I'll bless it. I'll send rain, it'll be okay. So you know the parable, you can probably tell me explain. Some of the seed fell on a path, right? And it was trampled, the birds ate it. And Jesus said, what's that like? That's like the person who heard the gospel, but immediately he said, no, I prefer to follow Satan. Some of the seed fell on good dirt, but it was shallow, too shallow. So when the Middle East scorching sun came, it just simply burned up the new plant. Jesus said, that's the person who hears the gospel, rejoices in it, believes, but when a few problems come into their life, they give up on God and walk away from faith. He said, some of the seed actually gets to the areas where there's good soil, but there are also thorns, weeds, and they choke off that little plant and kill it. What's that like? Jesus said, that's the person who hears the gospel, but they're too preoccupied with accumulating wealth. They don't have time for truth anymore. And so they lose their faith. And then he said, some of the seed falls on good ground and yields a harvest ten times or a hundred times what could have been expected. That's the person who comes to faith, believes it, hangs on to it, not only for time, but for eternity. So he had told that more profound, complex parable, and he had explained it. And now later in the chapter, he says, here's two more little farmer stories about what the kingdom of God is like. The first of which is in verse 26 through 29. In your folder, that would be the first paragraph. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like this. A man scatters seed on the ground, and while he sleeps and rises, night and day, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. That's the key point. The ground produces fruit on its own. First the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. The crop is ready, he swings the sickle without delay because the harvest has come. His point is the farmer throws the seed out there, he doesn't understand how this works, it's the laws of nature which God instituted and tells us about Genesis 1 and 2. It is a miracle. And Jesus is effectively saying different seed is going to sprout at different times, whether it's quick or it takes a while. It is a miracle. That's the point. It's appropriately found in Mark's gospel, the shortest of the gospels, because Mark is kind of like one of these movies that you see nowadays. You've seen every movie like this. Superheroes and cosmic wars and things like that. That's the gospel of Mark. It's just a lot of action and activity. It's half the size of Matthew. It's shorter than Luke not as circuitous as John. It's very much in your face, here's a bunch of miracles, Jesus did them, you better believe. That's Mark's approach. <clears throat> and in this little section, he's saying faith itself is a miracle. It is a miracle that occurs in our lives individually on different timetables. Let me give you an analogy of that. I grew up in Michigan, Somewhat like Wisconsin, you could keep a garden, you more or less turn the dirt, throw the seeds in, come back a few months later, stuff's growing. I'm not saying you don't have weeds, you got these nasty tomato worms that we don't have out in Colorado that you got here, maybe. I, I get that. But it's easier to be a gardener in the Midwest than it is out west. So I've come to appreciate it more that when a single seed will sprout, this is a miracle of God. With no water coming down from the sky, and it's 100 degree heat, it's a miracle. And again, this year, I don't live in a house anymore where I could have a garden out back. I'm in a, an apartment, a condo, with a 12 by 16 porch. It has a 26 pot cup there, full of dirt. And I planted the seed, same thing. The seeds that came up early, real quick. Many of you are gardeners, you know this. Lettuce, that's up pretty quick, right? Um, beans, radishes, throw them in, they're up by tomorrow pretty much. 
And then there's stuff that comes a little later on, which is a little longer. Carrots, my favorite, kale, cucumber. And then there's the ones that really struggled this year because we had a bunch of fires out west. Maybe you heard that. Not so much in Colorado, but we got the smoke and the ash from Oregon, California, and Wyoming, and Nevada. There was a lot of that stuff that was hanging in a brown cloud over Denver for most of the summer, plus 100 degree heat. So it took the tomato seeds and the beet seeds longer than usual to come. And then the ones I didn't want to plant, but I'm a dutiful husband. Mark what you plant some wildflowers. They won't come out. You gotta plant them back last fall. Plant them anyhow. Okay. And the neighbor lady wanted herbs. You plant rosemary now, it's gonna be a month before it's up. Plant it. Okay. That's how the gardening process goes. Different seeds sprout at different times. Everybody agree? Let's take it to another level. Example from my world. When I was in a room just like this. You said you used to have vegetables on the walls or something, right? We had that too. Before we had our own building, we worshiped in a room like this that was a lunch room, mini gymnasium for a grade school. And we had Mr. Carrot up there, and Mr. Tomato, and, and all that stuff too. More importantly, when I would look out on a Sunday morning, there'd be two redheads. When you're up here looking at an audience, redheads always stick out. Look at the fall guy where the hay and is shining. But the redhead stuck out, and I paid particular attention, I suppose, because once upon a time I was a redhead, actually an orange head. And usually over here, Tammy and her family would be seated. When I got there at 83, Tammy was 11 years old in my first sixth grade confirmation class. Flaming, gorgeous, red hair. Now they become gingers, right? There she was. Over there was Shirley. Well, was nine years old when she hooked up with our church. Our different story. Tammy had always been brought up in the Christian faith. They're the most godly people I've ever encountered. Um, brought that child up well. She bought it hook, line, and sinker. Had the privilege to confirm her. She went to college locally, met a guy, settled down, continued to come to church. Uh, it's just an example of Christian piety in this young lady. Shirley had a different story, 49 years old. How did she end up at our church? She had a good friend named Jerry, married to both of and they camped with one another. Jerry had counted Shirley, I'm told, for 25 years to come to church with her. And Shirley was polite and she was moral and everything, but went through the church scene. In that little school where we began to worship, that was one block from her house. Jerry bugged Shirley again, and Shirley said, maybe that's a sign from God that you're right down the street, and she cried. And she came to the information class, and she bought a hook, line, and sinker, and became a regular attendee and participant. That was in the mid-80s. I buried Tammy, <clears throat> mid-30, two young children, breast cancer took her. I buried her in 2004. I buried Shirley, the other redhead, took her a long time to accept the Christian faith, also in 2004, also cancer. What's the point of this? Different time periods, different reactions. We'll put that in front of you. Where are you at? Did you have Tammy's story? Is this all you've ever known? And has it, it, it has been a core value in your life for as long as you can remember? Or did you come to this more recently? Has it always been a process? Does it continue to be something that say, I go and want to look at spectacle? We're going to be all over the place. There's different seeds sprout in different ways at different times. That's what Jesus is teaching here. The only thing that matters, he says, is that the outcome is the same. Whether you've been a plant that's grown and been nurtured by the Lord through word and sacrament for all your life, or whether you're a Johnny come lady or a Susie come lately, in the end, you equally end up in heaven. That's the kingdom of God. That's the way that God works. Leads me to the second parable. Now that we've talked about ourselves as individuals, we can talk about us and them collectively. But the second parable is more speaking to the institution or the larger body. And what it's talking about is the mysterious side of the kingdom. 
Um, I suppose to fully appreciate this, we, we need to go back and read the Gospels from a, a businessman's point of view. What were Jesus' numbers? How well was he growing the church in the three years in which he was kind of the only pastor of the church, right? And the 12 disciples or apostles, they were like his vintage. What are the optics there? How big did that church get before Jesus returned back to heaven? Uh, at first, it seems, it grew exponentially. People were in awe. We've never heard a teacher like this. This may, in fact, be the Messiah. Nobody else has done miracles like this. And then came the big miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. And they said, this is great. We accept you as the Messiah. Would you please feed us for free like this forever? And I want to make him a bread king. And John 6 records that. It's a long chapter, but it's talking about what's the size of the king's going to be. Jesus took him aside and said, I'm not your bread king. The miracle was a sign that you should listen to my words. If you just want me to be your bread king, I'm not your guy. And what does scripture say? Many who had followed, many who had believed to that point, trickled away. And then we got three or more years of Jesus' ministry. We know how that went. He was opposed at every turn by people who hate him because he turned the apple cart upside down spiritually. Eventually they get their way and he's crucified, he rises and he goes back to heaven. How big was the church when Jesus left? We don't have a number, but it was seen there was that inner circle of 12. There was an outer circle of other believers. There were certainly some ladies who were involved, heavily involved in this. But it wasn't all that big. He teaches a parable about the size of the kingdom. I pay attention to that sort of thing in helping churches think of ways in which they can grow. And sometimes that spills over into it almost seems like you're growing just for growth's sake. And it's why I know stupid numbers like what I'm going to lay on you now. You want to hear some numbers about church growing in the last 70 or 80 years? You know when the United States peaked? in terms of people who actually went to church on a Sunday morning, and I told you this already, 1952 was the peak. We were not a church-going people back in the 1770s. We became a church-going people starting in the mid-1800s, late 1800s, and then again in the 1940s, as a result of World War II. And the peak, 1952, population of the U.S. was 151 million people. How many people were in church on a Sunday morning in a Christian church? 52 million, one third of the population. That's 1952, that's where we peaked. I got into the ministry in 1983. Already we had become a, church, a country in decline spiritually. And so the figure was about 27% across the country on any given Sunday morning are in a Protestant or Catholic church. Where are we today? 14, 13 percent. That's it. Just a hair over one out of every ten people are doing what you're doing on this Sunday morning. Those are the numbers. And I would tell you, it's awful that I know stuff like that and share it with you. Because it's measuring something that God says, you have no business measuring what I'm doing. In this section, he is talking about the size of the kingdom. He says, it's bigger than you think, and it sizes up to me. So look at that middle paragraph on page 9. Well, he was really verses 30 to 32. Then Jesus said, to what should we compare the kingdom of God, or with what parable may we picture it? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is one of the smallest of all seeds, planted in the ground, Yet when it is planted, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the sky can nest under its shade. Jesus is talking about the size of the kingdom. And it says again in agrarian language, that's going to be up to me how big this gets to be. That's the point. The size is going to matter on what God does, on God's timetable. I think we can take away two things from this. The first of which is be patient. 
mutation. Um, maybe the best example I can give you from 15 years of doing this now, full time, back when I was a parish pastor, I kind of did part time help the church get started as assistant mission board chairman. I was a mission counselor, that's all I do is help start churches and fix old ones. Maybe the best example I can give you from the last 15 years of doing this would be Hope in Toronto. Anybody ever been to Toronto? Fascinating city. It is in New York and Canada. One out of every four people in Canada actually lives in the Toronto area. When you get there, it is massive. You ever been to New York? Anything like that to say, man, this goes on forever. Toronto really does go on forever. Over the far east side of Toronto, we started a church back in the late 1970s in one of the most ethnically diverse areas in all of North America. And we got lucky, there was a Baptist church that went belly up and we bought it for a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's roughly the same size as what you got here, 12,000 square feet. Beautiful facility, a lot of support offices, just a beautiful facility. So we had some people and we had a beautiful facility, but that church struggled. And that's why I was there in 2006 through 2009. Working with them, helping them, we eventually changed the staff. And now that we had no pastor, I sat with those people and said, until we get a new pastor, how are we going to reach out to the community? They had done vacation Bible school. They had thought about doing a soccer camp at the church over West Toronto. They had 300 kids up there every summer. And yet they said, none of us like soccer. We don't know how to play soccer. We know how to play cricket, but nobody wants to play cricket. Because primarily they're a dark skinned people from Sri Lanka and the West Indies and the Caribbean, of course, in South America. 90% dark skin, 10% Anglo hockey fans and Asians. That was their church. So I finally said to them, What are you good at? I already knew what they were good at. Their music on Sunday morning is wonderful. They got a world class keyboardist, a world class organist. They got people who sing regularly with the symphony and the opera. The singing will just blow you away. That's not even the best piece. You ever seen steel pans? You know what that is? Oil drums that are hacked off and you can turn this. They got steel pan and alcohol, so there's like 15 to 20 people every Sunday playing that stuff. It'll make you cry. It's missional to it. I said, What are you good at? I don't know. I'm not good at soccer. I'm not good at music Bible school. We're good at music. Yeah, we are. You ever think of trying a music camp? You know, attracting all these kids from around the world who live in your neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Try a music camp. How do you do that? Well, it's like soccer camp where you don't do soccer. You teach kids music. <laughs> you teach them how to sing. So they did. They advertised, they built up to it, they did great work getting ready for this thing. And that first year they had 15 kids come. And they thought that they had totally failed. And I assured them, because I've been watching this for a long time, that's pretty good. Word of mouth is going to get out there. You get a world class teaching thing, and people are going to hear it. And sure, shoot, the next year they have 45. We are now somewhere in the 14th or 15th year, somewhere in there. Uh, every year they sell out 125 until they have room for it. And they have 12 different areas that you can participate in this. You can take guitar, you can take steel piano, you can learn how to sing like an opera singer. Okay? More importantly, what's come from that? Children whose parents were raised in Islam have been baptized. People from around the world who have come to Toronto to seek refuge have become Christian. Primarily through that music camp. What did it take? Patience. I'm probably talking to the choir here. You've probably heard it from Dan, you probably know it. We've got a good facility. We're going to try to do this a little different way. We normally have done it well. I just encourage you to do it well. And then be patient. And the second thing, very briefly, was to teach them by saying, I'm in charge of the size of the kingdom. God is saying, No, really, I'm in charge of the size of the kingdom. He says to us, Simply be faithful. What is the seed in all these parables? It is the gospel, it is the clear word of God. The simple message that you can repeat is certainly as I can. God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son. All are condemned. All are justified. All are forgiven. And that's it. 
What did he ask of us in participating in his kingdom? Be here every Sunday. Get around to Bible class. We got Bible classes in the middle of the week. Participate in that. Know the word, grow in the word, share the word. Be faithful in that. And God says in eternity, you will see the results. You will see the size of the kingdom that's been gathered in part through you. And by saying it's a mustard tree, which is the tiniest of all seeds, it turns into a 20 to 30 foot tree in a typical Middle Eastern garden. God is saying that kingdom is going to be a lot bigger than you think it is. God help you with that answer. Opportunity to uh, fill out our connection cards that's found in your worship folder. While that is taking place, uh, a universe will play with the banner. Day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach the same truth at this place and every day. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten. Heal those who are sick, heal those who are sad, humble those who are distressed, and comfort all who are old and Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessings to every nation on earth. Grant our borders, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your own name. In our prayers, we also pray for Alice Bird, whose sister Carol Smith, who suffered a stroke this week. And we also continue with prayers for Doug Petrowski uh, for continued medical assistance. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with Carol and Doug as they undergo various medical ailments. We ask that you would be with those that are entrusted to their care and grant them a full and speedy recovery according to your will. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be the
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated as we join in singing our next hymn, hymn number 559, Lord of the Living Hearts. Your friends in Christ and holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ liberated you from sin and death and made you members of his body, the church, through word and sacrament. You have been nurtured in faith. You have now been selected for positions of service to our Lord on behalf of this congregation. The Lord has entrusted you with an office which you are to carry out as his servants and according to his work. St. Paul wrote concerning service in the church. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesied, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. The Lord seeks faithfulness from all who serve, as Scripture says, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. The Lord does not seek from us what he has not given us. But when he has given a gift, his will is that we use it faithfully to his glory and for the benefit of his people. You are also, as servants of Jesus Christ and workers in this congregation, to set for your own families and the whole church the example of Christian lives. Make the word of God your foundation and God. Search it daily for comfort and instruction. So that the congregation may be assured of your willingness to serve, I ask you in the presence of God in this congregation, Will you diligently and faithfully carry out the office entrusted to you according to the ability which God gives you? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help you. I will, and I ask God to help you. 
I now install you as the church council members of Bethlehem Evangelical Lutheran Church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, for his John Richardson, Harold Thomas, these ones that get their mind shows, John Phillips. May God grant you his Holy Spirit and give you wisdom and strength to carry out your duties to his glory and for the good of his people. Members of Bethlehem Lutheran Church, I urge you to regard these fellow believers as servants of Jesus Christ and God's gift to his church. Pray for them, support them in their service, and help them so that through the gospel ministry of this congregation, more people will be reached for Christ in his name. Let us pray. Merciful and gracious God, our lives are open before you, and you hear our promises. We ask you to send the Holy Spirit into the hearts of your servants, that they may carry out their duties with diligence, boldness, and wisdom. Give them a spirit of devotion and prayer, that in every time of need, they may present their requests to you. Help them be examples of what is good, that by their lives they may build up your congregation and give the enemies of the church no cause for complaint. Make them a blessing to your believers. Help them to work with their pastor and with one another. And grant that by their service, the unity of this congregation be strengthened, your name be happy, your kingdom be enlarged, and your will be done. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Finally, go then and give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and preserve you. Go in peace. Please stand for closing prayer and blessing. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated as we join in singing our closing hymn in number 577. Rise, O light of Gentile nations.
And good morning to you all once again. Uh, just a couple of announcements for you. First, for this morning, and we thank uh, Pastor Bert Foltz for uh, being here with us and sharing God's word with us this morning. Uh, we thank uh, Bethany Babinick, uh, who's here with us, uh, uh, playing a piano for us this morning and helping us to lead us in music this morning. Thankful for those uh, blessings of uh, gifts that are there uh, to be used for the, the glory of God and for the, the joy of the uh, This morning, also, we have a uh, special uh, Bible class and meal that is taking place after our service. Uh, this uh, is an opportunity to, uh, at this stage in our mission work as a mission congregation, uh, Pastor Burkholz has a uh, Bible class that will be talking through some of those uh, specifics of how it applies here at Bethlehem principles to keep in mind a lot from that, uh, the principles from the sermon that we heard this morning will be echoed as part of that uh, study as we look specifically at the opportunity that Bethlehem has Bethlehem has uh, in Rockbridge and Bridgeland Center and surrounding area. Uh, also, we are celebrating Bethlehem's second birthday. Uh, time flies, doesn't it? Uh, and we'll have uh, a cake that will be there afterwards, uh, giving thanks for the uh, years given and for the opportunities that come ahead. Uh, the other large announcement wanting to, to uh, uh, make sure to communicate to our congregations is listed in our worship folder, but I feel it's worth me reading at this time. Uh, so we're all on the on the same page. The Lord has blessed us with a ministry plan moving forward as far as called worker support uh, and from a pastoral uh, staffing side of things uh, for how all of our three congregations will be moving forward. So I wanted to give that to you here. It's on page 17 in your worship folder. Dear members of St. John's Trinity in Bethlehem, as you are aware, our congregations have been in a vacancy since the beginning of summer with Pastor Forkles for retirement. After months of planning and examining options moving forward with our district mission board, the Lord has led us to this plan. <coughs> At our joint council meeting on Tuesday, Pastor Conrad Prell was called to serve in a quarter-time semi-retired role. Pastor Prell, after serving St. Paul's in Hillsboro and Zion Lutheran and Elroy in our area, recently retired and is building a house in Elroy. We are blessed that he and his wife have decided to remain in the area and give thanks that Pastor Prell has accepted our call. Pastor Prell will be serving as the second consistent face of ministry at St. John's and Trinity. Pastor Prell will be leading in worship twice a month and assisting with visitation ministry. Bethlehem will be additionally served by Pastor Charlie Isles of, from Institutional Ministries and Pastor George Birch, recently retired and recently moved to the Watertown area, with each leading in worship once a month. Pastor Isles has already been faithfully serving as a guest pastor for a number of months and we are happy to have his continued assistance on Sunday mornings. Pastor Birch recently had eye surgery and is going for physical therapy for the next few weeks. When that is completed, we look forward to him serving at Bethlehem once a month. This pastoral staffing plan will start in January. A date for Pastor Carl's installation will be scheduled in the near future. Until January, guest pastors have been lined up for the end of the calendar year. Our Senate is currently undergoing a severe pastoral shortage with over 100 pastoral vacancies in our church body. Our congregations have been blessed to find an answer to our call that allows us to continue to reach out with the gospel in our region and allows us to join together in worship, study, and service to our Savior at all three of our congregations. Please join us in giving thanks for the blessing of pastors who equip us for lives of service for his glory and purpose. And his service, Pastor Daniel Ruick and the Joint Councils of St. John's Trinity and Bethlehem. So those are the more bigger announcements at this point. Just a couple of small housekeeping items to put in front of you. First, uh, uh, for any Packer fans or just fans of pizza, uh, there will be a Packer pizza party taking place, our next joint fellowship outing tomorrow night at St. John's and Hill Point. Uh, things begin at 6.30, game starts around seven o'clock or so. Uh, please also send an, an extra special prayer for uh, not for the, the Packers, so first week definitely did not go well, uh, but for the Lions fans in our midst that go through that type of suffering every year. Uh, so, so if you want to know what it's like to be a Lions fan, go back and watch week one of the Packers this season. That'll give you a, a bit of a, a taste. Uh, for that. Uh, a couple of uh, things for leading up for, for Bible study uh, moving forward. So. Uh, uh, last week, Pastor Isles had a Bible study for us. This week, there's a special one here. Same thing for next week uh, with uh, Pastor Keith Free, our uh, administrator of uh, the Board for Home Missions. Uh, he will be here with us for our, what will be our mission festival service. A chance to hear from someone that's been well attuned to the, uh, the various uh, 
outreach opportunities throughout our country, as well as our Simmons ambitious plan to start 100 new mission congregations in the next 10 years. Uh, so he's going to talk about uh, some of those things and how God has been blessing those opportunities and the future opportunities he is giving. So that will be next week. That will be a special potluck service, uh, potluck meal that will follow the service. Uh, and so that is in, listed in your worship folder as well. Following that Sunday, we begin our regular uh, Sunday morning Bible study uh, that will be focusing on there's some of the table and the uh, leading into worship into the sanctuary here. Uh, of a book that we'll be using that follows a chronological approach to the Gospels. So it puts all four Gospels together with a chronological study uh, that's in a, very much in a narrative form. The only thing that's in the book is just the EHD text from the Bible. But it, it has it nicely laid out in more of a narrative form, so it's easy to read. Uh, so if you would like a copy of that book, information is in the worship folder as well as the sign-up sheet on that table. That is the book that we will be using for our study this fall and going all the way into next spring. Uh, so I'm calling this a year with Jesus. It's a really a wonderful opportunity to put all the Gospels together to see the clear point and to learn it maybe in a way that you haven't before. If you've never done a chronological study, it'll kind of help with the, that timeline in your head to better understand what's happening when uh, and, and to see that grace of God unfold uh, in the life of Jesus and what we see in the Gospels. Uh, so again, a wonderful study that's going to be coming up. The book information is there. Our podcast begins on September 27th. That will be following the same study. Uh, so that podcast will be an additional resource uh, from Sunday morning to help uh, understand more, to build more on that knowledge, and to grow more in the gospel. So that information is all listed in your worship folder. Uh, with that, I think that is everything. Is there an announcement that I'm potentially forgetting from anyone Pizza and cake. Yeah, so uh, today, pizza and cake. Uh, you will have your fill of pizza in the next two days. Opportunities for it. Uh, so that will be taking place along with Bible class and the fellowship hall. With that, again, God's richest blessings on your day and week. And is the, the answer that's in the worship folder. If you know someone that might be interested in that study of going through the Gospels together, uh, an invitation is in your worship folder that you can give to someone that talks about the Bible study that we'll be having. Uh, so an opportunity, if you know of anyone that has been wanting to invite the church or think might be interested in this type of study, feel free to uh, pass that uh, invitation along. God's blessings, and I look forward to greeting you in the back.